Hello and welcome back to my channel. This is True Crime with Cam. Today I'm going to be talking about the Broken Arrow killings. I want to give a huge trigger warning for today's episode because I do go into graphic detail about the brutal murders of adults and children as young as five years old. I will also be showing images throughout the video taken right after the murders where there is clearly blood. Some viewers may find this content too disturbing to watch or listen to, so viewer discretion is advised. After you're done watching this video, make sure to take care of yourself and stay safe. Hey y'all, before we dive into today's episode, I do want to give a massive thank you to my sponsor, Hunt a Killer. If you're a true crime obsessed person like me, at this point you think that you would actually be able to catch a killer. Well, there's a way to put your skills to the test. I've been so bored during this pandemic just scrolling through my phone and binge watching the same shows over and over. Thankfully, I have Hunt a Killer to break me out of my normal stay-at-home routine. Hunt a Killer is a monthly subscription box that brings a murder mystery right to your door. You'll receive a total of six boxes filled with different clues and items you use to solve the case. Each box can take between 90 minutes to 3 hours to complete. It's a lot cheaper than going out, especially if you split the box with friends or family to play with. It's basically like bringing an escape room to you. If you've solved your first box and you can't wait for the next one, you can go online and get it shipped to you the next business day. And you're probably wondering, am I hunting a real killer? As immersive and realistic the game is, no, we're gonna leave that to the professionals. But my favorite part about Hunt a Killer is that they are helping real people. Hunt a Killer donates a proceed from each box to the Cold Case Foundation. With these funds, the nonprofit organization is able to solve real life unsolved murders. Right now, you can go to huntakiller.com forward slash cam and use code cam for 20% off your first box. Do you have what it takes to hunt a killer? Okay, let's get started. So the town of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma has a church on every corner. It's considered to be a safe place to live and raise your family. They have the best public education in the state and their homicide rate is close to non-existent. But one brutal and horrifying event would leave people wondering just how safe their town really was. On July 22nd, 2015, at 11.30 p.m., a 911 call was made by a young boy. 12-year-old Daniel Bever quietly whispered into the phone, help, and I'm gonna play that 911 recording right now. So before we go into detail about what happened during that night, let's look at the events leading up to it. The Bever family lived in a large two-story home in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. They were described as a Christian family who mostly kept to themselves. They were close-knit and they really loved their privacy. Neighbors recall barely seeing the huge family, and when they did, they noticed that they were very standoffish. 52-year-old David Bever worked as a computer analyst and programmer, and sometimes he did work from home from his home office. His wife, 44-year-old April Bever, worked from home, doing odd jobs on computers. 
This large picturesque home was filled with seven children, the oldest being 18 and the youngest just being two. All seven children were homeschooled by April their entire lives. David and April especially tried to protect their children from the negative forces on the outside, but despite these efforts, negative influences made their way into the home through the internet. The Bever children had access to all sorts of things, including phones, tablets, computers, that allowed them to see whatever they wanted at the touch of a button. What's disturbing is 18-year-old Robert and 16-year-old Michael shared very common internet search histories. This involved mass shooters and fawning over the notoriety that they gained. Soon, these internet searches started blending with the dreams of their future. Most kids are looking at colleges, trying to find a job, but they were watching these YouTube videos and they really wanted to be these people. They wanted their own Wikipedia pages, they wanted to be famous, and they wanted to do it in the most gruesome way possible. Dr. Jason Beeman was a forensic psychiatrist on the case and he described the kind of life that Robert and Michael were living. He said, quote, I want you to imagine that you're isolated from the regular world and then you get a window into that world, but that window happens to be your obsession on YouTube with Columbine, serial killers, and mass shootings. It really becomes very easy for you to gravitate towards that, normalize it, and fantasize about that behavior. It's a perfect melting pot for dark thoughts and devious activities. With the degree of isolation that was here, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that that had something to do with these murders. He also explained that one of the traits of being a psychopath is the ability to read other people's emotions. Psychopaths can artificially simulate these emotions to gain the trust of other people. April and David Bever were taking care of children ranging from 2 to 18 years old. It's possible that they weren't even paying attention to Robert and Michael and were tending to the younger, more impressionable ones. And it's also possible, and more likely due to the circumstances, that they had no idea what was going on with Robert and Michael's mental state. During the summer of 2014, Robert started working for a company called Micah Tech. Micah Tech is a religious call center with guiding principles such as we honor the Lord in all we do, and core values like we believe that God has called us to do the work that we do. Robert eventually used the money he gained from praying with people over the phone to buy the gear he used to kill his family. So as the summer went on, Robert and Michael continued to jam their brains with violent and vicious content wherever they could find it. The 2009 Rampage film is especially Robert's favorite, and when we look into this, it becomes very disturbing. Rampage is about a young man whose life is taking a downward spiral. His parents kick him out, his boss won't give him a raise, he's working a job he hates, etc, etc, etc. He then prints fake money and uses it not only to build a suit of steel body armor, but to buy a plethora of guns and knives. He uses this armor and weapons in the film to murder 93 people. In the end, a video is played that appears to be a manifesto, and I'm going to play that video right now. This movie, along with the constant Google searches about mass murderers and serial killers, is what really set the tone for what Robert and Michael thought about and what they wanted to do. In the end, Robert and Michael wanted to do far more than watch these killers. They wanted to emulate them. During Michael's interrogation after he was arrested, he told detectives that Robert wanted to beat the kill amount of other people like Columbine and James Holmes. In other words, Robert wanted to be known for killing the most people. His true wish was to kill 500 people total. We'll never know the extent of what April and David knew about what their sons were doing, but we do know that someone in the house knew about everything they were looking at and what they were planning. The only person in the home who seemed to be disturbed by Robert and Michael's behavior was 13-year-old Crystal Bever. 
She was unsettled by the fact that her brothers were collecting a large amount of knives and body armor. She tried bringing up to her parents, but they simply brushed her off. They summed it up to, boys will be boys. In reality, these boys were planning, and they were planning on killing all of them. During Michael Bever's trial, the majority of that event is retold through the perspective of Crystal Bever. Crystal testified that around 11.30 p.m., her mother told her to tell her brothers to do the dishes. The only people awake in the house at that time was Robert, Michael, Crystal, and April. When Crystal walked into Robert and Michael's room, they were putting on body armor. And then Michael turned to Robert and said, should we do it now? Robert responded, yes. Michael then told his little sister to look at something on the computer. When she sat at the computer, Robert snuck up behind her, covered her mouth, and slit her throat. Robert's plan was that Crystal would die a quick and silent death, and then they would drag her lifeless body into the closet while they proceeded to kill the rest of the family. But Crystal managed to put up a fight. She started screaming as loud as she could until April came running in to see what was going on. Crystal then ran out of the room and through the front door while Robert chased her close behind. She was trying to set off the home's alarm by opening the front door, but Robert and Michael had already turned it off prior. Crystal ended up passing out in the front lawn due to the blood loss from her wounds. Back in the boys' bedroom, Michael had stayed behind to take the life of his own mother, 44-year-old April Bever. April fought back, but she was ultimately overcome by Michael. She suffered a total of 48 stab wounds to her arms, neck, face, chest, and abdomen. Crystal eventually regained consciousness after hearing the screams of her younger siblings. Crystal suffered several stab wounds to her abdomen and defense wounds on her arms. Robert had actually stabbed her so deep in the stomach that when paramedics arrived, her internal organs were spilling out. But despite the massive amount of blood loss, Crystal ended up surviving. Back in the Bever home, Robert asked Michael where all the other family members were, and Michael said that they were probably hiding. Seven-year-old Christopher Bever and five-year-old Victoria Bever had heard the screams of their older sister and mother, and they were terrified. Despite the children being smart enough to lock themselves in the bathroom, Michael and Robert would do anything to get in. Michael ended up knocking on the door and saying, let me in, he's gonna kill me. So the children thought that he was a victim as well and they wanted to save their older brother. To their horror, Robert was following close behind Michael wielding a giant knife. In Robert's testimony during Michael's trial, he said that he had killed the whole family and Michael hadn't killed anyone. However, evidence in Crystal's testimony recalling the night in graphic detail strongly conflicted this. Michael then entered the now unlocked bathroom and stabbed his younger sister and brother to death. Seven-year-old Christopher suffered 21 stab wounds to his back, chest, head, and neck. Five-year-old Victoria had 23 stab wounds to her neck, back, chest, face, and abdomen. The children both had defensive wounds from fighting for their lives. At this moment in the murders, it's believed that 12-year-old Daniel Bever is making the 911 call we heard earlier. And I'm going to play the end of that again one more time. After Robert and Michael killed Victoria and Christopher, they made their way to the home's office where their father, David Bever, usually works. And hiding behind a locked door was 12-year-old Daniel Bever. Michael then used the same false plea for help that he had used on Christopher and Victoria, and sadly, it worked. Towards the end of the 911 call, you can faintly hear Daniel saying, Michael, no. After some background noise, someone picks up the phone right before it hangs up and says, hello. It's clearly not the voice of 12-year-old Daniel Bever. It's clearly Robert or Michael. Later, it would be known during the trial that when Daniel opened the door to rescue Michael from Robert, Michael then said, he's all yours to Robert. Robert then grabbed Daniel and stabbed him in the stomach. Michael admitted to investigators that he took the phone from Daniel and smashed it on the floor. In total, Daniel suffered 21 stab wounds to his stomach, chest, head, neck, and back. At some point during Robert and Michael's murderous rampage, 52-year-old David Bever exited his room. He was immediately attacked by Robert and stabbed repeatedly. 
David suffered a total of 28 stab wounds to his neck, chest, back, and abdomen. In an upstairs bedroom was a sleeping baby, two-year-old Autumn. Robert had planned on killing their baby sister, but luckily Daniel made that 911 call and they knew that the police were coming and that they didn't have time. Michael and Robert then fled to the creek behind their home and waited for the authorities. When officers arrived on the scene, they didn't know the atrocities that had just occurred inside the Bever home. However, they did see blood on the sidewalk in front of the house and smeared on the front porch. It's assumed that this blood is from Crystal's attempt to escape after being stabbed by her brothers, but ultimately dragged back inside. When authorities approached the front door, they could hear a faint call for help. They knew that entering the home would be high risk, but they couldn't wait for an army of officers to arrive. One of the officers kicked in the door and immediately saw 13-year-old Crystal Bever. She was on the ground, lying in a pool of her own blood. She told the officers that Robert and Michael had stabbed her, and one of the officers could tell that she had blood in her throat and lungs. This occurred at 11.41 p.m., just 11 minutes after Daniel Bever's 911 call for help. They searched the rest of the home and found the bodies of all five victims, as well as sleeping baby Autumn upstairs, untouched. Officers searched for the killers, Robert and Michael, and they ended up finding fresh footprints behind the home. They dispatched their canine unit, which picked up a scent and found the two boys hiding. One of the boys was bitten by the canine and had to receive medical attention for it. In photos taken directly after their arrest, Robert and Michael are muddy, bloody, and geared up. What was even more jarring about these photos is Robert is seen smirking right after he killed his family. Blood on Michael Bever's face and body were tested, and it was later discovered that this was the DNA of his mother, April Bever. The Bever brothers' original plan had failed. They wanted to kill their entire family silently, wait for more guns and ammunition, and then head west to Washington to go on the largest killing spree ever recorded in US history. If 12-year-old Daniel Bever hadn't made that 911 call, there's really no telling what else could have happened. After their arrest, investigators claimed that when Robert was describing the attacks, he would occasionally laugh, and he told them that killing more than one person made him feel like a god. On August 3, 2015, the brothers entered a plea of not guilty to all charges. A detective who interviewed Robert took the stand during his trial, and he said that Robert told them that he had been planning on killing his parents since the age of 13 years old. Apparently, this murder plot began through late-night conversations with his brother Michael. Robert had centered his entire life about planning to kill his family. He told the investigator he had gotten a job solely to earn the money to buy body armor, knives, helmets, and guns. He ordered a gun to a shop in town and was expecting ammunition to arrive the day after the killings. Robert would have received 2,000 rounds of pistol ammunition and 250 rounds for a shotgun. Two-year-old baby Autumn, who was left untouched and unharmed, would have had her head chopped off with an axe by Robert. Her and the remaining family members would have been chopped up and stored in tubs in their home's attic. If everything had gone according to Robert's plan, they would have cleaned the entire house and set off in the family car to pick up the guns and head west. The brothers wanted to wander through densely populated areas and kill five people at random per place. Robert told detectives that with this plan, he would eventually kill someone that wasn't contributing to society, and that would be a good thing to him. Another one of Robert's plans that failed was filming the entire event. Apparently, Robert had planned on making two separate videos. Video number one would feature the bodies of his family, and video number two would feature the scene without the bodies and blood so it could be circulated on the internet. His whole plan was so eerily close to his favorite film, Rampage. Later during the trial, it was brought up that there were some intriguing pieces of evidence that suddenly disappeared while in police custody. Three years later, Detective Gayla Adcock would resign from her position amid the claims that she mishandled the evidence. The most notable piece of evidence that was missing was item 18, a hard drive from the Bever home. The Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation could not initialize the hard drive, and it was returned to police custody along with other pieces of evidence. The hard drive couldn't be located by the prosecution for Michael's trial, and Michael's defense lawyer made sure to point that out. After all, Robert told authorities that he planned the mass murder in his journal and on the computer. The defense claimed that the state failed to preserve relevant evidence. 
Another piece of evidence that was missing was Crystal Bever's journal. Apparently, the family had turned this over to an auction house after the police had concluded their investigation. An employee at the auction house who knew of the murders decided to read through 13-year-old Crystal's writings. The employee claimed that this journal had references to child abuse, but a year later when authorities recovered the journal, pages had been ripped out and there was no references to child abuse at all. No one could identify who tore out the missing pages. Prosecution responded to the defense by pointing out that all the evidence showed was that the hard drive was unreadable. And as for the journal, the defense had obtained the journal and had never asked Crystal if she kept a diary or if she documented incidents of abuse at all. When investigators interviewed Crystal in the hospital after the murders, she gave them some insight that they didn't expect. She told them Robert and Michael had been planning this for a year. They had been talking about wanting to kill their family and steal their money for a long time. She noticed how much that her brothers admired mass murderers and they thought that those mass murderers should have gotten away with their crimes. Robert and Michael truly believed that there was too many people in the world. When Crystal brought it up to her father, he was only upset about them wasting their money on weapons. Crystal was also able to give insight about the allegations of abuse. According to her, David Bever would throw her and the other children across the room in a rage when he was angry. She had also witnessed an argument between her parents that ended in David throwing April's head against a wall. While Robert was being held in jail awaiting his trial, on June 17, 2016, Robert attempted suicide in his jail cell. In Robert's cell, there was a large canoe-shaped tray for inmates who don't have a bed. Robert propped the sleeping boat up against a toilet in his cell and tied his bedsheet around it and around his neck. An officer discovered Robert and alerted medical staff. They had to cut him down and he was found uninjured. Due to this, Robert was placed on suicide watch and just three months later, he changed his plea to guilty. This allowed him to swiftly avoid the death penalty. At the end of his trial, he was sentenced to five terms of life without the possibility of parole, plus one life sentence at just 19 years old. In March of 2017, the Bever home burned to the ground. It had been vacant since the murders and investigators never found out what caused the fire. Just one month later, the city councilor Mike Lester raised $50,000 to purchase the destroyed home. Two years later, on March 27, 2019, the site of the horrendous loss was fully transformed into a memorial site titled Reflection Park. On May 10, 2018, the verdict was read for Michael Bever after just five hours of deliberation. Michael was found guilty of five counts of first-degree murder and one account of assault and battery with intent to kill. According to one account, at least half of the jury members cried when the verdict was read. Eight days later, scans from Michael's notebook he used in jail were released. These notes include crayon drawings of violent and disturbing moments. In one, he's calling cult leader Jim Jones his hero, in another, he's written white power with a Nazi symbol above it. The most startling thing that Michael created in his notebook was a sketch of the violence inflicted on his own family. He wrote, quote, Once upon a time, there were brothers named Michael and Robert. They hated their family, so they killed them. The end. On July 15th, 2019, Robert attacked prison staff with an eight inch sharpened instrument. This attack took place at Joseph Harp Correctional Center in the prison's day room, and no one was seriously injured. On top of the six consecutive life sentences, Robert was reportedly given another three additional ones. Robert and Michael will live out the remainder of their lives behind prison bars. Crystal and Autumn Bever were reportedly adopted by another family in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They'll have to live the remainder of their lives with the trauma they experienced at the hands of their own brothers. Even though Michael and Robert are behind bars, their actions will continue to have an impact on their surviving family members and the community around them for a very, very long time. So that is the Broken Arrow Killings. If you want to see more videos from me, make sure to give this video a thumbs up 
and subscribe for more. You can also subscribe to my podcast. I'm on Spotify and iTunes. My other social medias are True Crime Cam on Instagram and TikTok if you want some more daily content. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate every single one of you that likes, subscribes, comments, and I'll see you guys again soon.